Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloikeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Perhaps the most famous of all prayers. But what exactly does the Shema mean? Wow, there's tremendous depth. In fact, in the enumeration of the mitzvahs, there is a mitzvah to believe in God, and that's the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. And then there's a separate mitzvah, to believe or to know, to experience the oneness of God. And that's based on the verse, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. In this lecture, the first of a number of lectures about Shema Yisrael, we're going to take a journey, and I invite you to join me on this journey, of studying in the light of the teachings of Hasidus, the mitzvah of Achdus Hashem, of the oneness of Hashem. Before I start, I'd like to make a dedication. There just passed away one of the preeminent scholars of Chabad, a rabbi called Rabbi Yoel Khan. He was most well known as what we would call the Choyzer, the one who would commit to memory, review, and then give out the sikhas, the talks of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Many of the talks of the Rebbe were given on Shabbos or Yom Tov when it was halachically prohibited to record them. However, Rabbi Kahan, Rabbi Yoel, as is popularly known, had a genius mind and was able to record in his memory these sikhas, these talks, many, many hours of talks. So, for example, the Rebbe would start off a bring at 1.30 p.m. on Shabbos afternoon and many thousands of chassidim there, but you had a number of chayzerim, a number of people who have gifted memories, who would sit down, record in their minds what the Rebbe was saying, and after Shabbos, just say it all over again, so that it could be actually written, and then it was finally edited by the Rebbe and published. But that was part of his genius. Another part of his genius was the ability to take the Rebbe's teachings and to organize them and to give them out in a format which was orderly. And this he did magnificently in an encyclopedic work called Sefer Arochim Chabad. I'll just hold up a volume over here. This volume is the volume on Achdus Hashem, on the oneness of Hashem. It's an entire volume dedicated to the teaching of what the oneness of Hashem means, Le'yachadoi. So, as you can understand, it is a voluminous subject. We are greatly indebted to Rabbi Yoel for having illuminated the subject with his encyclopedic knowledge of Hasidus and his amazing capability to organize the subject in such a profound way. And it is within the shiva of his passing, and we would like to dedicate this talk in his memory. It says that the words of Sadiqim are their memory. Rabbi Yoel is very much alive in his writings, in his teachings, in his verbringens, and his mentorship to an entire generation of Chabad students. Yehei zichrei baruch, may his memory be for a blessing, and may his neshama, his soul, have an elevation, and I'm sure he would be very touched and proud that during his shiva, we bring his teachings and his work to the fore and to discuss them at length. We're going to start this evening 
with a historic perspective. Now, the Pasuk Shema Yisrael is written in the Parsha of Vo'es Chanan. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Ve'ahavta Hashem Elokechad. Note that the Pasuk Baruch Shein Kvod Malchusa Le'olam Vo'ed is actually not written in the scripture in the parsha of Ve'es Chanan. It was later included in our daily recital of the Shema because it is a mitzvah saseh, a positive commandment of the Torah, to recite the Shema, B'shoch b'cha u'v'kumecha, when we lie down in the evening, in the evening Shema of Mariv, and u'v'kumecha, when we get up in the morning. It's a mitzvah to say the Shema twice a day, and of course, we also recite the Shema. Most people know at the crescendo of Yom Kippur, right at the end of Yom Kippur, we pro proclaim the Shema, and of course, before a person goes to sleep at night, and eventually, just before a person passes from this world, we recite the Shema. So it's a central pillar of our belief, of our faith, it's fundamental, but what exactly does it mean? <clears throat> Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to the time that Jacob had descended with his family to Egypt and Mitzrayim, Egypt, was Ervas Haaretz. It was the nakedness of the land, steeped in idolatry. So much so that the Jewish people in Egypt were tinged by this idolatry, except from the tribe of Levi. And in fact, this oneness, belief in monotheism, which Avraham Avinu had so carefully nurtured, and Yitzchak and Yaakov, in fact, on Yaakov's deathbed, he wanted to make sure that his children all believed in it and they proclaimed on to him as he was passing from this word world Shema Yisrael they said here Yisrael which was another name of Yaakov their father Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod we believe in monotheism in the idea of one God which was rediscovered by Avram Avinu in fact of course, Adam Harishan, Adam the first man, had spoken to God. Noach had spoken to God. And Avram Avinu had rediscovered the oneness of God out of the <clears throat> multiple deity worship of where he came from in Urkastim. And having publicized the oneness of God, the monotheistic belief, it was passed down to his children, to Yitzchak and to Yaakov, and now the tribes are saying, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And Yaakov responds, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchusoy Le'olam Vod. Which is why that Pasuk is now inserted, although quietly, as we'll explain later. So, simply stated, it is our belief in monotheism. In a world where there were multiple deities, Judaism proclaims its belief in one God. How did this notion of multiple deities come into being in the first place? Rambam, Maimonides, explains that in fact, although at the beginning of creation, you had Adam, Arishan, Adam and Eve who conversed with God, nevertheless, later in the generation of Enosh, there started this idea the God is a infinite God. God is a God who is vast and powerful and doesn't interest himself so much with the affairs, the lowly affairs of human beings, but rather delegates that to other ministers, just as a king would delegate to his ministers. And the king is not so interested with all the minutiae affairs of state, but rather that's taken care of by various departments. And so God has the sun and the moon and the stars and all the various constellations through which he delegates the running of the world. 
That's how idolatry started. It was this notion that God is a super being who is spiritual and aloof from creation. And what happened in the course of time was that the principle was forgotten and the secondary, the idea of the constellations and the stars and the sun, one can understand the sun. The sun provides heat, it provides warmth, it provides light. Without the sun, there would be no photosynthesis, there would be no life. And the same thing is true of the stars, that the stars, through the stars comes the various influences to creation. And hence the concept of Avoida Zora, a strange type of service was introduced. And this happened or started in the days of Enoish and continued until Ha'ikor, the principle, was in fact fully forgotten. So much so that Avram's father, Terach, produced idols. He had a, an idol shop and it's a well known the story of Avram smashing the idols in his father's shop, of which Avram was then thrown into the furnace in Urukastim. And that was one of the very first miracles of his being saved and his journey, Avram's rediscovery of monotheism and his journey to proclaiming monotheism in a polytheistic society and world. So where will that eventually lead to? Let's now fast forward to the future. Rashi, in his commentary on Chumash, says... What does it mean, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad? It means, here, O Israel, the Lord that is our God now, Hashem Elokeinu, will eventually, in the future, be Hashem Echad, will be one God, a God of all the nations. In other words, eventually, there will be the realization of monotheism throughout the entire creation. And all of creation will recognize the one God. This is the past and the future altogether. <clears throat> the, the reason why idolatry actually started was because of a grave error in the understanding of what God is. In fact, Enoish, in that generation, misunderstood God to be some defined entity, something which was removed from the physical and something which was much more ethereal and spiritual. And since, therefore, God is not so interested being a spiritual being in the physical, he delegates that to other uh, proxies which thereby control the creation and the whole idea of monotheism is that in fact the constellations the stars and so on and so forth are not intermediaries but rather they are implements so just as a craftsman who uses a tool let's say the axe in the hand of the woodchopper one would certainly not attribute any power to an axe. One would certainly see the axe just as the tool, the implement of the wood chopper. And similarly, if one sees a hand in a glove, one certainly wouldn't attribute any movement to the glove. One would only see within the glove the power and the movement of the hand. And therefore, the principal recognition of monotheism is that there is only one God. There aren't multiple gods. And this is a notion, of course, which goes against the multiple deities of the time, that there were different gods vying for each other. The concept of one God is there is one super being that collates all and controls all. And also that he alone is the master of the world. So let's have a look at nature, for example. Nature has rules of nature. And 
God operates through those rules, not that <clears throat> the natural order is caused by physics, but in fact it is God who operates the world, but through a set of laws called physics. <clears throat> the same would be in our work. We tend to have the notion that we apply our prowess, our business acumen, our minds to making a living. And in fact, the Torah tells us, God will bless you in all you will do. We have to do. One cannot rely on a miracle. One can't wait at home and wait for the check to come through the post. One has to do something. And yet, simultaneously, it is the blessing of God that makes a person wealthy. So, on the one hand, a person has to do something to create a vessel, but on the other hand, they need to know that that is only a vessel. And it is the blessing of God that fills the vessel. Hence, in order for the vessel to be full, it's necessary that the vessel be a kosher vessel, that the business should be kosher, there shouldn't be any cheating, there shouldn't be any lying, there shouldn't be any devious business, but rather, if the vessel is kosher, it will bring in. Ah, we see people make sometimes make a lot of money through devious means. Well, the question is, what is the money used and spent for? It's better to earn less and the money is used for healthy things than to earn more through devious ways and unkosher ways and the money is spent on unhealthy things. So the concept of monotheism has great impact on our daily lives and even on our midos, even on our character traits. So for example, let's take anger or arrogance, the uh, inability to forgive others because of a perspective of control. All of this puts God out of the domain of control. However, our belief in monotheism is that God is in control. And consequently, if somebody gets angry, so for example, let's say you're sitting in a traffic jam and your blood is boiling as why is all this happening, says the Gemara, Kol ke'ilu aved, aved The somebody who gets angry is as if they are serving idol worship. Now, idol worship is one of the cardinal sins of Judaism. Just because a person is getting angry because there's a traffic jam, why is that considered idol worship? The answer is, is because a person has put the control of the world outside of Hashem's domain. They think that the traffic jam is a result just of <clears throat> somebody who's blocking the traffic and so on and so forth. No. We need to know that everything that happens in the world is controlled and is orchestrated by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, by Hashem. This is the meaning of Hashem Echad, that there is one God, there is a God who is the Reboina Shalolam, there is the God who is the master of the universe, and there is no other God beside him, and we may not worship any other God beside him, which would include the gods of ego, the God of money, the God of pride, not just physical deities, which are considered literal Aveda Zara, but any Aveda, any service which is Zara, which is strange, so to speak, to the concept of Achdos Hashem, of the oneness of Hashem. This is traditionally what we would call the classic understanding of the mitzvah of Achdos Hashem. However, Hasidus comes along and revolutionizes the whole concept of Achdos Hashem. The second part of Tanya, called Shar HaYichud Vohe'amunah. It's a 
thesis which rolls out the understanding of Hasidus in Achdus Hashem, it revolutionizes the concept and consequently also revolutionizes our perception of the oneness of Hashem, which changes the way we think about ourselves, about creation, and about our avoda. Now, it starts with the Pasuk in Parshas Vashanan Vayodaita Hayoim, you should know today Vahashavesa Al Vavacha, you should take it to heart, Ki Hashem Hu Alakim, the Hashem is Alakim Bashamay Mimal in the heavens above, Vala Uras Mitachas, and on the earth below, Ain Oid, there is nothing else but Hashem. Now, simply meaning, we could understand that also within the frame and the prison prism of what we've previously explained. In Shomayim, in the heavens, there were those that said that there were other deities, such as the sun and the moon and the stars. On the earth, there were perhaps human gods and so on and so forth. So the Pasuk says you should know and take it to heart that there's no other god. Comes along the Alter Rebbe in Tanya and says, Ein Oid. The words Ein Oid, there is nothing else, is actually to be understood literally. Ein Oid means there is no other existence apart from God. Now, we human beings don't need to be convinced of the reality of existence. We have senses, we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. With all our senses, we can see and experience a world. What does it mean that there's nothing else beside God? Does that mean to say that the world is an illusion? There were philosophers that actually said that, but that's not our perception. Where does the world fit in with this notion that there's nothing else besides Hashem? And here we enter into the tractate, the sugya of Achdus Hashem, of the oneness of Hashem, as it's presented in the teachings of Chassidus. We actually need to look at two truths that coexist. On the one hand, God is the only existence, and on the other hand, the world is authentic and valuable. How do we know the world exists? Because Torah, which is Torah's MS, the Torah of truth says, Bereshes bara Elohim Esa Shamayim Vesaretz. In the beginning, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. And Torah is true. And when Torah says that Hashem created the heaven and the earth, the heaven and the earth exist. And at the same time, there's nothing else apart from Hashem. How do we put together this duality of existence? This is the theme of the oneness of Hashem in the teachings of Hasidus Chabad. So let's start off by having a look at a transcendent perspective. <clears throat> there is a verse in Malachi that says, Ani Hashem loy shonisi. I Hashem, I haven't changed. In other words, the God that was before creation is the same God after creation. And creation did not affect any change in God. Now, considering the multifariousness, the diversity, the infinite range in creation itself of all the various kingdoms of mineral, vegetable, animal, human, 
all of which is created by God, how can we say that God has not changed? Surely creation should effect a change in God because God has created something. So that something surely was not there beforehand and therefore some change has happened upon creation. What did Malachi mean when he said that I, God, have not changed? A student of Chassidus and Kabbalah will have learned the concept of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum simply stated means that before creation there was a Eagle Hagodl. A large circle. This is not to be understood in spatial terms, but in conceptual terms. Which the Oyer Einsof, the infinite light, filled that circle. And in order for the finite world to be created from the infinite, it was necessary that the power of the infinite be concealed in order to allow a vacuum, a space, which is called a hollow, a mokamponui, for finitude to emerge. In fact, God has power both in the infinite and in the finite. What was manifest before creation was the infinite, and in order to create, it was necessary to conceal the infinite in order to reveal the finite. And once there had been the symptom, which was the contraction or the concealment of the infinite light, it was possible for the power of finitude to emerge, and what was created was a seder hishtalshalus, a chain order of creation, where in this chain order, which was built like a chain, with each link connected to a higher link, there was a step-by-step -step reduction of the infinite element until the finite physical creation was created. In general, we refer to four stages in that creation, the worlds of Atsilos, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asiya. However, all of that only came into being after the Tzimtzum. Once there had been a Tzimtzum, it was possible for a reintroduction of a beam of infinite light, which was called the Kav, and that Kav was slowly occluded and reduced until what was created was a finite world. That, the study of Seder Hishtal the order of creation, is a mitzvah rabba, is a great mitzvah, and is dealt with at length in the Eitz Chaim of Reb Chaim Vital, and a much greater length and detail in the works of Hasidus. In this presentation, we're going to look at it in terms of Achdus Hashem, of the oneness of Hashem. What is important to realize is, is that when we talk of symptom of concealment, we talk in terms of Gevura, of self-restraint. Chesed, kindness, is revelation. Gevura is restraint. But just like you have the right arm and the left arm, the right arm representing chesed, the left arm representing gevura, both are arms of the same body. Whether there be revelation or there be concealment, both, in fact, which seemingly are contradictory, are actually one and the same because both are expressions of the oneness of Hashem. So God is not, if you want, hiding behind the tzimtzum. The tzimtzum itself is also part of Hashem's creative capability and the tzimtzum is not opaque but rather it's transparent. In other words, Hashem 
is actually unchanged by his creation. Because although the world, from our perspective, has been created, from his perspective, it's a mere revelation or manifestation of his creative abilities. Now, that is all a perspective, if you want, from above. However, it says in the Torah, You should know today and take it to heart that you, a mere mortal, needs to understand and to be able to digest the concept of Achdos Hashem. And when we say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, it says in the Code of Jewish Law in Shulchan Aruch, what should we be thinking of? That the word Echad is made of three letters, Aleph, Ches, and Dalet. Aleph refers to the Alufa Shaloylam, to the Commander-in-Chief of the World. Ches is numerically eight, which is the seven firmaments and the earth. The Dalet are the four directions. The, the four directions, the seven firmaments and the earth, are all made and orchestrated by the Aleph. So when we say Hashem Echad, what we mean is, is that all the four directions and all the worlds are all made and created and orchestrated by one, by one God. In fact, that is what we mean when we use the word Echad, because Echad can numerically come before a second number. In fact, there's a contrast between the word Yochid, the one and only, and Echad. Echad represents oneness within diversity. As it says on the dollar, e pluribus unum, one out of the many, whereas Yochid is the one and only. How do we square the existence of a diverse creation and at the same time understand that that is all a manifestation of one God and in fact a creation of one God and there's nothing else beside God. Ein oid. Let's introduce here the concept of Bittel. Bittel means nullification, often a concept used in halacha to describe the nullification of one item in another. So, for example, let's say a drop of milk falls into some chicken soup. So, is it kosher or not? The answer is, if you have 60 times as much soup than the drop of milk, then you say the drop of milk is bottle, it's nullified within the other entity of the soup, and it's kosher. So the idea of bittel is the idea of self-annulment, self-abnegation, subservience. And achtus Hashem means not that we deny that there is a creation, because, as we said beforehand, God did create a world. But rather the notion of bittel allows us, instead of becoming self-centered, it allows us to move to a position of being God-centered. This journey from being self-centered to being God-centered, a journey of Bittal, is the journey of Achdo Hashem. In fact, that's the mitzvah liyachadoi. The mitzvah pa'amayim b'chol yoyim, twice a day, is to embark daily on that journey, whether it's at night or during the day, 24 hours a day, on the journey of Bittal. The journey to appreciate that the world which we see and everything within it is orchestrated and created by one God, and in fact, we become thereby conduits to that oneness itself. 
In order to understand this concept, let's introduce the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov of ongoing creation. And after that, we'll stop and for Ezra Sashem in the second part of this talk, we will carry on and develop further the theme of Achdos. There is a verse in Tehillim which says, Lacha Hashem Nitzav You Hashem, your words are standing in the heavens. Which words? The ten utterances with which Hashem created the world. Ba'asora Mamoris Nivra Ha'olam. Why does Genesis use speech as a metaphor for creation? Because words are a distillation of many thoughts. So the concept of contraction, condensing, tzimtzum, in order to bring out something lesser, focused, is the idea of speech. It's explained that Letters, each letter of the Aleph base is a certain configuration of divine power. And just as you have the periodic table in chemistry, whereby if you mix sodium with chlorine, you get sodium chloride, so too by putting together various letters you can create. This idea is explained in Sefer Yetzirah where it says that one brick builds one house, two brick, two houses, three bricks, six houses, four bricks, 24 houses, five bricks, 120 houses. The idea is if you've got two letters, Aleph and base, you can write them Aleph base or base Aleph. If you have three Aleph base Gimel, Gimel base Aleph, mathematically it's three times two times one. Four times two times three times two times one. If you have five letters, it's five times four times three times two times one. If you have 22 letters and then add on the final letters as well, then you have a huge number of combinations. And especially if you use chilufim, which means you can interchange letters like at, bash, you can interchange an ala for a tof and tumores and change them around. All this is explained in Sefi Yetzirah and in fact known in the powers of the occult. It's well known that magicians they would say abracadabra. And of course, the words are just Aramaic. Abra, it's from the word bara, I will create. Kadabra, as I will speak. They were aware of this idea of creation through speaking. In fact, even as late in history as the Maharal of Prague, who lived in the 16th century, 15th century, he was able to create a golem, a frag, using this practical Kabbalah in order to create this uh, figure, the golem, which would ward off uh, blood libels in that time. Today, we don't practice practical Kabbalah in that sense, but the concept of combination of letters in order to create is, is well known. The Baal Shem Tov came along and said the following, Based on the verse, L'cha Hashem Devorcha Nitzo Bashamayim, your words, Hashem, which you said then at the beginning of the creation, the ten Ma'amores, Yehiyoyer, let there be light. God didn't just say those at the beginning of creation and that was it, but rather the words that he said then are still standing in the heavens, which means that God is continually pumping into creation divine creative energy. And if he would withdraw that creative energy for an instant, then the world would cease to exist. So take, for example, a ball which you throw up into the air. What is the natural state of that ball? The answer is, because of the force of gravity, it is to rest on the ground. However, when you take it and you throw it into the air, you invest kinetic energy into the ball, which overpowers the force of gravity until the kinetic energy runs out, the force of gravity prevails, and the ball falls down back to the earth. But whilst it's in its upward trajectory, 
it's actually going against its natural state. Its natural state, because of the force of gravity, is to be on the ground. Because it has some kinetic energy which is put into it, which will overcome that natural state, it flies upwards. Similarly, creation itself, only because Hashem invests the power into the letters of creation, each of which, the combinations of which, can create the world, it's because there's a constant pumping of divine energy into that creation that the creation exists. And hence the Baal Shem Tov taught that even if a leaf turns over in the wind, it's also by divine providence because the wind, the leaf, it's turning, although it seems natural and although dictated by laws of nature, is in fact orchestrated by God, created every single second, and hence Hashkoch Protis by divine providence, although it looks to us as quite natural. So therefore, when we ponder on this concept of ongoing divine creation, we then come to the realization that in fact, ain't oid, that although there is a creation, and the creation is a true creation, because Bereshis bara Elohim, Hashem created the world, nevertheless, the fact is that creation only exists because of the divine creative energy which has been pumped ex nihilo, something from nothing, into the creation. And if God would withdraw that divine creative energy for an instant, the world would revert to its state as it was exactly before the six days of creation. Now, the implication of that teaching is that God is extremely involved in creation. He's very close to us. In fact, so close, even in the minutiae, even in the dots and crosses of creation. Take, for example, a, uh, a kaleidoscope. What seems to be millions and millions and millions of unrelated points but when sometimes you can just move it and you see the pattern in it, it's magnificent. Well, that's exactly how creation is. There seems to be billions ad infinitum of different points, and yet there is one underlying force, that super being, which actually puts it all together. And that, and the conceptualization of that, the realization of that, the integration of that, is in fact the mitzvah of Achdos Hashem. The Ezra Hashem, in the next class, we will expound further on that in talking about what's called Yehudi La and Yehudi Tata, the upper level of unity, the lower level of unity, and the levels of Bittl B'Metzias and Bittl Hayesh. And in fact, where all this is leading to is that on a daily basis, each one of us not only proclaims our belief in the one God, and not only proclaims our belief in the fact that God is the master of the universe, but in fact, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad is something much deeper. And that is that the whole of creation, Ein Oid, there's nothing else besides God. Ah, I exist, and there is the I, and there is the me. So ultimately, there needs to be the transformation of being self-centered to God-centered, that ultimately I become a conduit, a channel for the divine. And that has to be through everything which God created in me, through my intellect, my emotions, my desires, my willpower, my thought, speech, and ultimately in all my actions. We will, as was Hashem, continue in the next class discussing how we can implement the concept of Achdus Hashem, of that oneness of Hashem, 
and integrate it ultimately in ourselves, in the entire world. And in fact, by Yoimahu, when it's done in the entire world, the role called Bas as Isaiah says, all flesh will see Kipi Hashem Diber, that the mouth of Hashem has spoken, Hashem al then Hashem will be a king over the entire universe, and Hashem Echod Echad, he will be one, and his name will be one with the coming of Mashiach, Bemhera Yomeno Amen.